Okay, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Chris, and this I'm is my Ryder. business partner, Ryder. Thanks for coming out. So tonight we're talking about real estate metrics, uh, basically the lingo and the language of real estate investing. And you want to understand all of these metrics, not just so you can talk about real estate, but so you can identify good deals. Uh, so you can have a litmus test on, because there's so many, you know, you go to Zillow, there's hundreds of, of properties for sale. Uh, and you want to be able to quickly weed through and narrow it down to the ones of the most interest that you want to like go drive by or call in about. So all these metrics will help you get there. So first, we can never stop talking about ourselves, and that's my favorite. Yeah. My and favorite. We, and we actually something. we did try to shorten that part of the presentation. So those of you who were here twenty minutes. last months, don't worry. <laughs> Only twenty minutes. Yeah, minutes. Uh, that le that'll leave eight minutes for the presentation, but. <laughs> Uh, so then we'll talk about our Prezo objectives, uh, get into the meat of the metrics. Uh, we have, I think, eight uh, different I, metrics I think eight, that you yeah. want to learn. Then a couple of non-metric considerations. We'll take questions. Then we've got member introductions. So start thinking about that. We just sort of pass the mic around, yep. say your name, what you came here for. If, and then, you, if you have a deal or you're looking for something in particular, uh, that will be the time to let everyone know. Exactly. And then we'll move on to uh, networking again at the end. Yep, and after the networking here is done, uh, you don't have to stop networking. There's a place um, just 100 yards down the street where we're going to go and have a beer. Um, anyone that wants to join us there is uh, welcome to continue the networking there as well. Only after about 15 minutes after the meetup, we just kind of got to get out of here. All you can handle, bro. All the networking you all ever want. Yes. Uh, mandatory disclaimer. So we just like to disclaim that uh, we're not perfect. Guess this what? This is intended <laughs> for rational adults. Uh, so everything we tell you, you know, do your own due diligence and your own research. So first, so you get to know us. If you haven't been to a VIG event before, is anyone new to uh, our meetup? Yeah, who's here for the first time? Wow, well, a lot okay, of newbies. About at least a third, I'd say. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Hopefully, you'll come back. Uh, that's yet to be determined, I guess, over the next hour. <laughs> you did enjoy the pizza, so. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're we're glad you came. We try to do this once a month. Uh, we've been doing it the last Thursday of every month. For the last uh, two years. For or the so. last couple of years. <clears throat> so my name's Ryder. I'm a, a native Texan. I've been in corporate America for a long time. I uh, eventually started my own company about two years ago. Uh, so I went to school in University of North Texas uh, near Dallas. Uh, now I run a digital marketing company uh, at this co-working space. I actually highly recommend this co-working space if you are a freelancer or looking to move your company. Uh, it's kind of a funky, cool vibe, as you can see. Um, then I got into about, yeah, about eight, eight years ago, I got into real estate because of the, I guess it was called the Obama tax credit is you got $8,000 for buying a house, which doesn't do much for you in San Francisco, but in Texas, it's pretty significant. So it's, I guess it was like 5% discount on a house. Uh, so I bought my first house. Uh, after that, the market was still very down in 2010. Uh, so I was doing the math and I'll show you some of the formulas uh, that I was using to calculate deals. Uh, you won't see these numbers in the current market uh, typically, but I started buying three plexes and four plexes and just sort of thinking, okay, if this is the rent and this is the mortgage and, and this is, uh, and the, the gap is that much, I can make a lot in uh, multifamily real estate. So I got into real estate in 2012. Uh, since then I've turned a lot of those apartment rentals into Airbnb rentals. Um, it's just sort of the model that I like and it's uh, lower stress. Uh, I've done a lot of shiny, shiny object chasing in real estate. So <laughs> I have a varied, uh, uh, you know, things that I've done in real estate. I've done house flipping. I've done wholesaling. I've done uh, lease options. Uh, I actually just sold one of my lease options uh, or, or I will sell my lease option next week. Uh, I've done uh, quite a bit of private lending lately as I get lazier in my real estate career. Uh, and boat and RV storage, I have one in Pottsboro. And then Chris and I together 
Uh, we've partnered not just on the VIG, but in a couple of deals. Uh, so we have a, a drive up self storage facility. It's five and a half acres in uh, Bonham, Texas. If you're not familiar with uh, the metric of acreage, uh, as us Texans are, it's you know probably more than a city block. It can hold a lot of cows. <laughs> uh, we have a thousand unit self storage conversion that we were part of for a syndication, and some other people in the room uh, were also part of that Milwaukee syndication that we did last December. We're in the final uh, stage of closing a 700 unit self storage conversion syndication in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And actually, what I just heard on that uh, syndication, we thought we were all done with the um, funding, but it turns out that there is someone who might have been getting cold feet at the very last moment. So if anyone is still interested in joining that syndication for, um, I think we that person was committed for 75 or 100 grand. Um, if you're interested in that syndication, uh, come talk to us and would love to uh, talk all about it. We didn't. We didn't plan to mention this, but it just came up today. It was a person that had committed, and now it seems like they were less committed than they thought they were. Cool. So, Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, so, people ask me, uh, where did you get that accent? And I always, had a tell stroke. Them, I always tell them I got it on Craigslist. I <laughs> traded it for a coffee table and a set of rims. And then <laughs> people look at me like, what, what? But uh, no, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands originally. I came to this country by way of the uh, Caribbean, uh, where I originally went for an internship. And then I, I don't know, that five years later. <laughs> so um, I uh, graduated in uh, business economics and business management. Um, I used to be a, a consultant and then a, a business analyst. And at some point I figured out that work wasn't really working for me, um, that took me an amazing long time to figure that out. I guess I'm slow. Um, I had a, a performance review one day and basically they're saying, it's not like you're doing anything wrong, but like you're doing, you're one of the best of what the people that we have that do what you do, but just we just can't give you any more money because you already make too much money. And I didn't know there was such a thing. And um, then I started to get involved in real estate and um, I own 18 apartment units in uh, Stockton, all in the, uh, the residential segment. Uh, so uh, two plexes, triplexes, that, that sort of stuff. Um, I do quite a bit of private lending and, um, and like the writer said, we're, we're partnered on the uh, self storage facility in Bonham and the syndications. And my latest project is a, a 38 unit um, apartment building in Yuba city, which I, Hope to close on on October fifteenth. Um, I'm doing that with uh, two uh, partners. Uh, one of them is actually in the room here. Let's see if you can spot him. He's got a he's got the biggest mustache in here. Just 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 saying. So um, yeah, that is the uh, the short version of my uh, investment uh, in investment journey. And now I'm a full time investor and have been for a, a few years now. And I hope to never have to get a job again. Cool. All right. I guess you can leave now if you are done. <laughs> so the presentation objectives are determining, you know, which investment is best. It's harder than you think. Uh, there's so many deals. You'll get inundated with potential deals, especially when you're talking to brokers and they're kind of uh, presenting things to you. So the objectives will be covering commonly used and thrown around real estate metrics. Our, uh, IRR, what is uh, cash on cash, uh, and some other you know, common metrics. Which ones are used when? Because there's appropriate times to use certain metrics that might apply to say a commercial deal versus a single family deal. And learn which, me uh, which measures uh, to use and which to ignore. And then highlight some of the limitations that certain metrics have. So you don't wanna just say, oh, I ran this calculation, the metric was, you know, 3% and higher than 2% is good. Uh, so I'm going to buy the deal. So there'll be a couple of caveats and things you'll want to dig into uh, a bit more. And then we'll share opinions, insights, and experiences. Cool transition slide. <laughs> so the 1% rule, if you're a fan of, say, bigger pockets or some other real estate uh, and educational who, material. Who, who here, just by show of hands, who here is on bigger pockets and is familiar with bigger pockets? 
think most of you, That's everybody a great listens resource. to the podcast. Great resource. Um, but it's a really simple formula to use. It actually, they used to use the 2% rule, but then I guess the market slowed down a little bit mm -hmm. and now it's a 1% rule. Uh, but it's a really uh, quick like uh, rule of thumb in saying, is this deal worth looking at more closely? And the way it's calculated, I mean, there, you, you have the formula here, but I think the really simple way to, to look at it is what percentage of the rent uh, is of the price? So if the rent is $1,000 and it's a $100,000 property, that's the 1%. It's 1%, right? And obviously you would want to get, theoretically, you'd want to get more than 1%. You but you but more. if it meets at least 1%, I personally would say in my market, with, which is Stockton, California, if I could still get 1% rule today, I might even consider buying more there. So it's a good rule of thumb. Right. So if you get 2%, if you say you're getting $2,000 on a $100,000 property, that's 2%. So the higher percent, the better. Um, there's a lot of caveats, right? So it ignores expenses. So if you're getting $1,000 in rent, that doesn't tell you how much of expenses uh, you're paying. Um, it could also, 1% on like a, a house in a really bad neighborhood wouldn't be as attractive as 1% in a house in a really good neighborhood that's like brand new. It wouldn't need any repairs because that $1,000 rent if you have uh, a lot of repairs you're going to have to do, if it's a bad neighborhood and you think the tenant would, you know, trash the place or move out a lot, uh, that's not factored in the 1% rule. We're talking about a totally different cost structure. In the, uh, pictures, I put the picture there of um, some properties that both duplexes. One of them is built very recently. The other one is built probably like 110, 120 years ago. Um, those properties, as far as the 1% rule is concerned, may get exactly the same um, score. But the cost structure, of course, is going to be totally different between those two. Right. And then you've got the price to rent ratio. This is a market cash flow predictor. So the ratio of homes to annualized rent, or how many years of gross rent buys the property. So you're, you're basically asking yourself, how many years would I need to rent this out to pay for the house? Would it be like in Detroit, you'd only have to rent it for six years, 6.27 years to pay your, uh, for the rent to pay for the property. So basically, if, if your annual rent would be $10,000 and the house would be $100,000, the price to rent ratio would be 10 because it would take you 10 years of gross rent to pay for the entire house. Exactly. So if you compare, say, Detroit, uh, a struggling market versus Manhattan, a high in demand market, uh, you're looking at 6.27 years versus Manhattan, 50, over 50 years uh, to pay yourself back for the cost of that pr uh, property. Um, so there's obviously some different uh, advantages to buying in the different markets, right? So in Detroit, it's probably a much harder property to manage. There's a lot more costs as far as like renovations uh, and maintenance, and you're, you're going to have higher turnover. Uh, you're going to have much less appreciation, uh, where in Manhattan, you get all of those advantages, right? It's going to be appreciating. You're going to have very stable tenants. And also keep in mind, so this is a score. It's obviously better that it's lower than higher because you would make your property back sooner, right? However, the reality is that if it goes under, let's say 15, theoretically your rent would be 10,000 a year, but in reality, you're going to have high vacancies. There's people going to be moving in and out. Some, most of the times when they move out, they might not pay on their way out. So obviously this ratio is a theoretical ratio. Price to rent is assuming that you actually get your rent every month out of the year. Um, and that you actually are able to collect it and not just in theory. So that, that is one, one of the drawbacks from this ratio. However, when you look at the market or at a property, it's a very good uh, first impression. And as a rule of thumb, I think you'd want to be between 15 and 25, unless you really know what you're doing. If you're really investing for appreciation and you know exactly where to invest for appreciation, because that, that's your game, then you can go higher than 25. 
if you're really good at managing in um, markets that are not so good, war zones, um, then you can go under 15. However, there you got to be aware of the risk both ways. So we used to do this at the first. Yeah, but nobody would listen. <laughs> who who you, wants to you hear people about sponsors, wouldn't listen. Right? So now we uh, share our sponsors in the middle, and we're very thankful to them. And uh, not just because they, you know, supply the pizza and the drinks, uh, as well as our video uh, recording service. So Interest Group is uh, as a self-directed IRA uh, company. So there, our contact there is Bill Neville. If you're interested, I can, you know, Chris and I could introduce you or uh, give you his contact information. And if you haven't tapped into the power of self-directed IRA, it is a very powerful tool especially if you have a retirement account and you're watching it earn a couple percentage points a year uh, with stocks and bonds and the limitations of your uh, retirement fund. Mm -hmm. So basically when you move from the traditional IRA, uh, like the Fidelities or Wells Fargo into a self-directed IRA, you can invest in almost anything. You can buy Bitcoin, you can buy precious metals, uh, you can buy a racehorse. You can buy into our syndications. Oh, and you can buy Just real same. estate. Yes, but any type of real estate. You could buy a duplex with your IRA. And if you say, but I don't have an IRA, if you have a 401k with a company you used to work for or under some other circumstances, any retirement plan, you might be able to roll it into a, um, a self-directed IRA. And it's really self-directed. You decide where you want to invest your money and you have full uh, control over that. You follow the rules, but full control. Very powerful, Ryder and I are both doing that, and we were doing that before we, um, before we um, had the Entrust Group as a sponsor as well. That's actually why, why we asked them, because we were really comfortable with them sponsoring this, um, and we're really comfortable endorsing them because we have quite a bit of money with them ourselves. And then we've got the Topstone uh, Investment, also, I think they're changing their name to Roof for All uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And so what they do, they buy and hold single family rentals in the Midwest. Think Kansas City, uh, I think Chicago, St. Louis, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. They're buying these, uh, you know, distressed properties and they're renovating them. They're putting Section 8 tenants in them. And if you're not familiar with the government uh, Section 8 program, Basically, if you qualify, you have low income and you, you have the needs, uh, they'll give you a housing subsidy. So basically, as a landlord of a Section 8 house, the government is paying your rent. So you don't have to, to worry about the tenant ever not being able to pay the rent because the government is. Yes. <clears throat> and, and that can, can be a big hassle to Section 8 tenants unless when you're specialized in it. And that's what these guys do. I want to reinforce these guys are not a turnkey provider. If you want to buy turnkey properties, I can give you some names of people that can, you know, if you want to buy some properties in the Midwest, people that can help you do that. These people are not looking for people to buy their properties. They're looking to buy and hold their properties. They have about 600 properties already, but their specialization is the um, Section 8 tenants. So basically what they do, like Ryder said, they buy a uh, property that's in a bad shape. They rehab the property to bring it um, up to um, the standards of Section 8. Then they get a Section 8 tenant in there through their connections at the uh, office that handles uh, Section 8 tenants. And basically the government pays their rents. Usually Section 8 is considered as a lot of hassle. For example, in my properties, I will not accept Section 8 tenants because it's not that the tenants are a problem, but there's all these little regulations that you need to abide by, which is a lot of work unless that's all you do. And for these guys, they manage their own properties. They're specialized in it. They only want to rent out to Section 8 tenants. So they get all the benefits, but very little of the drawbacks because they know how to handle it. And it's literally all they do. So what do they have to offer to you? What they need is funding for their properties when they acquire them until when they move them off into a um, fund. So they acquire it. They need the cash to acquire it and to rehab it. And then once the property is fully stabilized, it's got a Section 8 tenant in there, they move it off into a uh, fund. They still continue to manage it and they own part of the fund. So what they need is uh, funding. If you want to buy notes, 
They write out notes on these properties. It's um, they give you a one percent interest per month. The notes are twenty five grand each. So I I have um, I have a lot of their notes myself actually. Uh, that's one of the reasons I endorse them. Um, so for every twenty five thousand dollars, can can I get your mic for a moment? So for every twenty five thousand dollars, there is. Um, there is $250 coming into your account every month. You don't have to deal with tenants. You don't have to deal with anything. Um, the money gets just dropped into your account. And it's only for um, about 12 months or sometimes even less. The drawback from this is that you might get your money back sooner, basically. So your money is not tied up for 30 years. You, um, they write you a note on the property. So you have a first lien um, on the property. You get 12% per month paid out monthly. Um, but they might, after eight months, say, hey, we want to um, tap out these properties and move them into the fund, but we have some other properties for you that you can slide into, or you can just get your money back. I do a lot of lending with these guys. Um, lending is not what you'd want to do for very long-term wealth creation, but as a way to get started in real estate and to keep your money occupied while it's not doing anything else, this is a great way to do it. And I know very few places where you can get... That's that much underlying uh, value and stability for um, for such a good uh, return. Yeah, I don't know many places you can get a passive twelve uh, percent annual rate of return. Totally passive. Yeah, that that's the best part of it. You don't deal with tenants. You don't deal with anything. The only thing you deal with is that they um, they do electronic transfers of the money into your account. The hardest thing you'll have to do is when they say, "Hey, we'd want to uh, tap out that note." that you have to go to UPS office and um, get a document notarized and send it back to them. That's basically all. That, that, that's my experience. I highly recommend it. If you want to know more about it, um, I can refer you to them. Uh, Ken's email address is also on the slide. Cool. So first formula is return on investment. Uh, so if you work in any sort of uh, analytical or business environment, you might have heard of return on investment or be familiar with it. It's basically a formula that takes the total income minus the total expenses divided by the total expenses. Uh, it's easy to understand. It's easy to calculate. You'll see some of the other uh, cal you know, calculations look more like uh, trigonometry or algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one, very simple. It takes expenses into account as well. So unlike... Um, you know, some of the other formulas we looked at, it does take expenses into the consideration. It can be deceptive though, right? So it just disregards time. Yes. And so, time is really important, right? Yeah, so basically if I have a project, you, you can say the return on investment for this project is 30%. You don't know how long the project is. Would, would you rather have a return of investment for 30% on your project in one year or in 10 years, as far as this number is concerned, it is all the same. So it totally disregards time. And also typically the way people talk about return on investment, it does not consider leverage. If you're a real estate investor, which I hope you guys are, or at least aspiring to be, you'd want to use leverage. Leverage is the bank loans that you can get um, to, um, to put more money to work for you. This formula kind of ignores uh, leverage, and that is the biggest drawback when applied to real estate of the return on investment uh, formula. Question? Yes? Can be a year, but I, I, I have seen it applied in a lot of creative ways. And it's, e e even if it is a year, though, it doesn't tell you anything about the project altogether. But it's what the good thing about uh, ROI is, though, it's very simple metric. But then again, if you look at a real estate project, right, where you have a couple of years of cash flow and you have a sale at the end, do you want to see the returns for year two? Right? Or do you want to see the returns for year four? You cannot look at them in, in isolation. That that is one of so I, I agree with you. You you can say, hey, you know, for for this year, like let's say you're holding on to a property forever, which I wouldn't recommend. You could say, This is my annual return on investment. But I think you'd want to look at things as a um, as a project and not look at an individual year. year. If you have a three-year project where you have like a little bit of cash flow in year one, two, and three, and at the end of year three you sell it, and that's where your big payday is, this doesn't really take that into account unless you look at the project as a whole, in which case it becomes pretty invalid 
Does that make sense? Then we've got cash on cash return. You also see this uh, shortened to COC or CCR. And it helps you find the best place for your cash, right? So it's the same formula as our ROI, except COC only considers the cash you have in the deal. So you're not considering the purchase price of that of that property, but you're just looking at the, the cash that you put in. So if it's a $100,000 property and you put 20% down, then instead of using the hundred thousand, you're only looking at the twenty thousand. Um, so this, this in a lot of ways is if you're evaluating different investments, is is a way it, it's already. I, there's some reasons I don't like it, but it's already way better than the uh, return on investment metric, because this one actually considers what you put in the deal. For example, let's say you have twenty thousand dollars to put towards a deal. Would you rather put that into a deal where you can get when you can borrow? eighty thousand dollars on top of that and make money on the eighty thousand dollars or would you rather put it into a deal that you can only buy for all cash where you can only deploy your own twenty thousand and not buy anything be beyond there did, did this is something that um it it makes a really big difference leverage is one of the uh, the big wonders of real estate i mean to try and get a bank to finance your stock portfolio or your options trading or your what were the other bitcoin that would be a good, good one to try and get some financing on. So this one takes that into account because the type of financing you can get varies per project. If you want to buy a rundown property in Detroit, you might not be able to get financing for that. If you want to buy something that is, you know, um, totally, um, it's a very, how do you call it? It's Turn a very, key. yeah, very turn, turnkey investment. It's in a place where there's good, um, good, good equity in the property. You will be able to get a loan on that. And what you typically see when you get a loan on something, you can make a lot more money because you now not just make money off of your own money, but also off of the bank's money. And the bank's got a lot more money than you do. So that's where the real money is at in real estate. So that, that, that's why we like cash and cash a little bit better than the uh, previous uh, metric. Again, cash and cash, you can apply it to a project as a whole, or you can look at individual years. But for a typical real estate project that has an exit, looking at an individual year doesn't, I mean, it tells you something. It doesn't always tell you everything. So that um, that is one drawback. The other drawback here is that uh, cash on cash is good to look at like let's say you have investment option a b and c and you can invest in either a b or c it helps you beforehand to say i think option b is best because i'll get my best return for the cash that i actually put in based on the financing i can get and all on all other uh, circumstances associated with the project however this isn't a great metric if you own property and this is the example that when, when I put this together, I was thinking I should mention, um, I have some properties in Stockton where my cash on cash return is very, very high. And I can sit there and pat myself on the shoulder or on the back and say, you know, I'm an awesome investor and look at how great I'm doing. However, it doesn't consider one very important thing and that is equity. And we're going to cover that um, in the next metric, but it's it's really keep that in mind. If you're looking at your existing portfolio and right now you're thinking, you know, I'm doing pretty well because I only put this much money in. I'm getting this much money back. Um, the next metrics and a metric and I want to spend some time on that. It, it does consider equity because for your when you look at your existing portfolio, that really is a big deal. Cool. Let's take a moment to like kind of talk to some people in the uh, in the audience. Uh, if you're, you know, a bit experienced, maybe you bought a property or a few who has, you know, looked at these formulas or who's used different calculations that are determined, uh, you know, when they, when they wanted to buy a property show of hands. Sure. I didn't have a formula, but I did notice there were, um, spikes in the property prices in Australia. So uh, I always try to buy after... Ju Ju Julian, can you help him get in? Uh, Sorry. I always tried to buy after it had been flat for a while so that it would go up in price just after I bought it. And that worked for me. Okay. So... Let's so some other hands go up. Yes. Anyone else want to share? Come on. 
Not all at the same time. Come on. I I know John uses metrics. John uh, does a lot of uh, flipping. Yeah. So, what do you use most, uh, John, to evaluate one project versus another? Oh, uh, you got it. into it. Okay. Um, I I have a formula I, s I set up where we, we basically look at, mm -hmm. you know, I I leverage everything. So, like the last house I flipped, I put three thousand dollars in. We made one fifty eight on it. Mm -hmm. So basically, looked at it's always in the price you pay up front. Mm -hmm. You get it the lowest you can, and then figure out what it costs to fix. So you go seventy five percent. You go seventy five percent times that after we have value, what it's going to mm -hmm. pay, what's going to cost, what's what you can sell it for once you've fixed it, and then minus the rehab cost, and then and then I figure out. That's how I figure out if I want to buy the house. And do you take time into account, like how long it will take to do the work Absolutely. and to get it turned around? Absolutely, because that, I leverage that's the money, so I'm paying money every month. So the last house I flipped, I was paying 4000 a month for the money. Yep. But I put 3000 in, and I made, with my partners, I made 50000 so Good. And are you looking for people to help you finance these things? Absolutely. You I might look, find some here I always look for private investors. I, I can, you know, I find out what you need in terms of for your investment, but we could pay it monthly or, you know, or, or even end. bring you in as, as, as a partial partner. partner. I've done that as well. And then for the for the I'm doing Florida right now, trying to do rentals, so I'm mm -hmm. using cash on cash return. Cool. Yeah. So it okay. just makes sense because I yeah. can see what I'm putting into it, how much I'm going to get in yep. return, and you know, yeah. does it pay for us? Expenses exactly. minus. And yeah. and I, I I totally second that. When when you're looking at evaluating different deals that you might want to get into. I think cash on cash return is a very uh, powerful uh, metric because it actually tells you based on how much you put in, how much do you get back. Exactly. And you yeah. can always tell. I, 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 I have some formulas again and I look at it and I go, nope, cash on cash return, anything less than one, forget it. So, But yep. you want it higher than one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just looked at one today. I didn't look at it yesterday. It sold really quickly. Cash on cash return was was 20%. I was like, oh wow. my god! I know. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, that try try and find that in California no, right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The 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 only thing with uh, Florida that I see is that Florida, just like California, is is highly cyclical. However, it seems to be not as far ahead in the cycle as um, California is at this moment. Yeah, they've gone slower. Like I was, this was Tampa. Tampa is hot. It's a hot market right now. But so anyway, those are the formulas I mostly use. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks, John. So yeah, so let's look at this uh, next one, and I really want to stop on this one for a while because, yes, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, go 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 one slide back. So the question was for uh, for cash on cash, how do you estimate the expenses? Um, it really depends on. I mean, it's. I, I hate to give this answer, but it it is really situational. It depends on: Are you doing a flip? Are you investing in like an apartment building? Are you? You gotta. You 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 gotta kind of know what you're doing, just like with anything else. That doesn't mean that if you've never done it before, you cannot figure out. But I would say talk to someone who does a similar thing in a similar market. Like if I would want to learn about fl flipping in the East Bay, yeah. then I would go and talk to John and say, hey, John, I know you're flipping in the East Bay. What what do you see? Like how much does it cost you to redo this? How much does it cost you uh, on a yearly basis to, to do that? Like I personally like... If you want to know about what it costs to do buy and hold investing in Stockton, I can tell you. Um, I have pretty good, like, I keep all my, um, I have software for it. I keep all my data. I keep all my numbers. Um, I know a lot about that. So if I see a property in Stockton, like a duplex or a triplex, I can make very accurate um, predictions on what it will cost me to run that property based on all the other properties that are just like it that I already own. However, if if I didn't own a property in Florida yet, I wouldn't really know how to do that. So I would go and talk to someone who owns properties in Florida. I I, I hate to give you like a vague, roundaway answer, but does does that give you an, an anything? Uh huh. Yeah. 
Oh yes, it's I I for for my properties, but but again, like we were saying earlier, I think on the first metric, the um, the the one percent rule, we were talking about the different cost structures in Stockton. I have. I can tell you, like, if you can buy at the sort of prices that I bought at, I can tell you pretty accurately what your actual cash flow will be per month, pretty accurately. However, when you would have bought for the same price some old, I call them horror house Victorian, I mean, they're very pretty, but, like, my contractor cannot do the, like, the fish scale siding and all those delicate ornaments, and then there's cast iron plumbing and such. It's got a way different cost structure. So you got is for that particular particular type of property like on the properties that that i own they're all built in a similar period of time they're all in a similar part of town so i i have a pretty good idea and a pretty good way to predict what the next property is going to do but if i would buy a property even in the same town that is built a hundred years or it's in a different part of town that might be off so it's 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 a science and art and at the same time so it's you just have to look at what other people do yes one more question uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's exactly. Yeah. One one once you're familiar with a market and you own some assets in the market, or you know someone or talk to someone that owns some assets in the market, um, you can you can predict it pretty accurately. Like what what you have in Cincinnati, I have the same thing in uh, Stockton. I can. I, I can say per, per door how much it will be for me um, as far as expenses. And then that also includes uh, reserves, like stuff that happens that you, you don't expect. Because I think a lot of people, they just look at their expenses and they go like, this is my property management. This is my um, insurance. This is my taxes. This is my repairs. But like you said, they don't calculate for the roof breaking or a new garage door. Or all of a sudden, you know, like... It does need a new kitchen cabinets or something like that, which can kill your cash. Like I've had properties that I had to put a new AC on, which is four grand. And if your cash flow is only like 250, I mean, do the math. That means you're not making a lot of money there for a long time. Now, my advantage is that I have so many of them that it, it evens itself out very steadily. But it does give you an idea um, because you, you own properties in the market. Nate, are you saying his mic doesn't record, or? Okay, so this better? I'll I'll hold the button out. Don't touch the button. I I I, I will not. Let's go to this and uh, next one. So this this one for me has been a very. Um, it, it took me quite a while to figure this one out. Like I started saying just a moment ago, it took me quite a while to figure this one out. Um, I was thinking I was doing pretty well. My cash and cash returns were uh, were awesome. I I have, like I said, I have software. I use Buildium. Uh, I track everything that goes on with my properties. I know down to the comma, you know, um, to to the last decimal place, I should say, um, what what everything costs. Um, I have all my historical data, so I was thinking, wow, you know, like with the amount of money I still have in this property, and that goes down every year as the loan gets paid down. And I'm like, wow, you know, my cash and cash is starting to be pretty awesome. I think I have a property there where my cash and cash return is like 50%. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm a pretty awesome investor. And but then, you know, I, um, I learned about this metric, uh, return on equity. And I think this, this is not a metric you should worry about too much if you do not have a portfolio. But if you do have a portfolio and you think you're doing pretty good, uh, look at this metric and then ask yourself again, how, how are you doing? Yeah, so, this is also a good one when you have a low appreciation market because your equity won't mm -hmm. be built up when the property appreciates a lot, yes. right? Yeah, that, that, that is a good point that Ryder has there. If you can buy the same property 
somebody um, in a market that has appreciation or a market that doesn't have appreciation, you might say, hey, the cash and cash return is the same. However, in the end, and this is my personal opinion, and I know there's a lot of people that are very seasoned in real estate that share this opinion, in the end, you make your money on the exit. Think about it for a moment. I know all of you are on bigger pockets and you're always talking about cash flow and all that. Cash flow is great. You gotta have cash flow. If you don't have cash flow, you have no value. However, and, and also you cannot hold on to the property. However, in the end, the real money in real estate is made on um, the exit, so when you sell the property. So when you look at a property beforehand and you buy something in Detroit because it's got great cash flow, please realize that when you sell it, you might get the exact same amount that when you bought it for uh, 10 years earlier, only that money won't be worth anything anymore by then because of inflation. So that there, there's also a pre predictive value in this measure, like Ryder was saying. But what for me was the really big eye-opener was that... Um, I thought I was doing awesome on my um, on my real estate because my cash and cash returns were so great, like like I said, close to 50% on some properties. And then I looked at my return on equity. So this, this is basically all your income minus your expenses divided by the actual equity you have in the deal. And then it turns out that my return on equity was somewhere around 3%. I mean, I could buy government bonds and get 3% and not have to deal with all these people. Because it's like they call it passive, in, passive, you know, investment. Um, it's not really a passive investment if you own duplexes and triplexes. If you don't um, own any, take that from me. If you do own some, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, basically, what I would, if you have a portfolio, what I would ask you to uh, to look at is say, hey, you know, how much are you making on your equity? Because in the end, um, let's say you have an equity of two million dollars, right? Let's say your equity is two two million dollars in between all your different properties. Calculating your cash and cash returns doesn't really matter. Maybe uh, you you stuck in five hundred thousand dollars in cash in the beginning, but now you have an equity of two hundred thousand. So you have a theoretical working capital of two hundred thousand. You could put two hundred thousand dollars to work. Um, sorry, two hundred thousand. Two. You could put two million dollars to work if you got that money out and redeployed it. And that's one of the things that I'm doing right now. Um, I just sold a duplex not too long ago. I had a lot of equity in that duplex. I had decent cash flow, but the cash flow was decent, but the equity had gone up so much that it didn't make sense for me to hold on to this duplex. I, I, I hope everybody um, un understands this one. Yes, Noah. When is a good time to kind of take a look at that? Every day. Yeah, no, I... I I am, I am joking, but I'm not. It's this is something to be continuously um, aware of. It's like uh, however much time you want to spend on it would be would be up to you. But uh, this is something that if, if you haven't looked at this in six months or so, this is probably something that you'd want to take a look at. I think a good point to look at it is when you can make more on the equity. In a different investment. Yes, that that also that that is yeah. Go go ahead, Ryder. Go ahead and expand. Yeah, on that. so that is a good way to look at it. So say you bought a property for say you put fifty thousand down, and now it's appreciated for another fifty thousand. So now you have a hundred thousand dollars in equity in that property, and let's say that property is rent is you're getting a thousand dollars in rent a month. So could you make more than that if you took the hundred thousand out? and use it as a down payment to buy like an apartment complex, like possibly, probably. So when you see that, uh, maybe it's time to make a move. I think it helps. I think it's definitely an important factor, especially if you're buying in a high appreciation market. Like say if you buy in San Francisco, you're never going to make cash flow, right? You're buying for appreciation. So when you're evaluating, because obviously people still make a lot of money in Bay Area real estate, but they just do it through appreciation. Yes. And that's something you need to be able to forecast. Yeah. And it's like um, 
those sort of forecasts, there's, there's, there's different ways to go about it. Um, but typically also you have a pretty good way to say, like it sometimes it's hard to see how much appreciation you will have, but there's certain markets where you won't have any appreciation. So if you look at the market historically, and properties are still selling what they were sold, what they were selling for 15, 20 years ago. What do you think? Are you going to get appreciation? I would think not either. And it's not what my broker told me. Yeah, exactly. Because every market is about to turn around, right? It's been that way for 50 years, but now it's going to change because something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Amazon, yes. <laughs> Unless Amazon is coming in, because then all bets. So Am Amazon's coming to Detroit. I drop everything I just said about Detroit and the um, <laughs> and the bad appreciation forecast there. But but but, but anyway, did this one, and I wanted to spend some extra time on this um, because of that, that reason. This is something, it took me a long time to realize this, but your equity in your portfolio is the uh, working capital you have. And you got to put that working capital to work where uh, you can get the most return for it. And that might not be where it is at this moment. Like we put, and I'm not going to talk you through the whole um, example here. Uh, you can uh, do that at home. If you want the slides, just uh, let, let me know and I'll make them available. The, um, the example here, though, it shows a property. I think this was the same property as... Uh, that we saw in one of the previous examples where the cash on cash was great, but this one shows that there was appreciation and all of a sudden the return on equity on something that's a great cash flowing deal, the return on equity is only 1.7%. That means that if you would sell that thing, get that money um, in a bond even, you would make more money and you wouldn't have any hassle. Samir, did you have a question? Yeah. That, that, that is one way to, um, to um, improve this ratio. Very good point. I'm very glad you brought, brought that up. So your return on equity, do you have to sell? The answer is no. You can reduce your equity by refinancing the property and taking some of that equity out so you can put it to work somewhere else. That, that, that is one way in which you can um, make this ratio look a lot better. And also a lot of people say, but I'll never find an investment that is as good as this previous investment. Well. If you do the numbers on this, and I would encourage you to go home and practice this in Excel, if you have a property right now where you're getting 20% cash on cash return, but your return on equity has dropped to 3%, if you can find a new investment where you get 10% cash on cash return, you're still going to make a lot more money than you do right now. And this is something like the reason I spent so much time on this, for, for me, this was eye-opening. When I realized this, um, I, I made some uh, changes. And this is also why you want to put as little down as possible, typically. Yep. You don't want to, this is why you don't buy houses all cash or 50% yeah. down. Yeah, when, when, when you hear people talk about, oh, you know, I own this many properties, all free and clear, um, don't listen to anything they say because they do not understand real estate or at least not um, maximization of their returns. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, no, not necessarily. So you mean the your lender was, requires that? The, the, the question yeah. was for a rental property, um, you have to put, do you have to put 25% or more down? Typically, <clears throat> if you want to buy like a duplex, um, most banks will ask for something like that. But you, you don't have to do business with most banks. To be honest, all the properties that I bought in Stockton, I did business with most banks. So yes, I did need to put, I couldn't go with like 5% down or anything like that. If I would have looked harder for more creative banks or you don't go with banks, you go with private lenders or, you know, a hard money lenders or um, a bridge loan or anything like that. Or you can, if you have a primary house that you have equity in, again, you take your equity out by taking, for example, a HELOC, a home equity line, um, home equity line of investment. So you can buy the other property, then you own it for a while, then you can refinance it. But yeah, you, the, the short answer is you're right. A regular bank will ask you for a higher down payment on the second property, unless you plan to go and live there, which some people do. They plan to live there and then all of a sudden they change their mind after they get the money from the bank. 
I don't know anyone personally that got in trouble for that. I wouldn't advertise you to, be, to commit uh, mortgage fraud, of course, but you know what, 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 what I'm saying. But also, there, there's other ways. Like I said, you don't have to do business with you know, Bank of America. I actually would, would hope that you'd shop around a little bit. But yes, so, but, but even so, <clears throat> if you can take your equity out of the one deal that you were only getting 3% return on equity, you can apply it towards the next deal. You don't have to get the same awesome returns on the next deal. <clears throat> even if your returns are lower, because you get your returns on more money now, you are going to make more dollars um, in every month, basically. Yeah, I think we milked that one pretty good, but I did want to spend some time <laughs> on that. <clears throat> so, yeah, this one, uh, the simple rate of return. I will not spend too much time on this because I don't like this one so much. <clears throat> simple rate of return is this. If you have a project for, let's say, four years with an exit at the end, so you're an investor and somebody offers you a project and say, hey, in year one you get this much, year two you get this much, year three you get that much, and year four you get your money back plus this much extra. The simple rate of return tells you if you take all the proceeds from the project and you average them out over all the years, how much would you get on average per year? Syndicators and people trying to find investors for longer term projects, they like to throw this one around. Why? Because it totally ignores the time value of money. It says, hey, you know, like, um, yes, you'll, you'll get over the whole course of the project, you'll get X amount of money back. We're going to divide that by the number of years in the project. So that is your rate of return. So let's say you have a four-year project and you get $100,000 back. It would say um, on, on $100,000, you would get $100,000 back. It would say that's a 25% annualized return. However, that number would stay the same if you would get most of that money back in year one versus year four. So think about that for a moment. The number wouldn't change, your simple rate of return wouldn't change, whether you get your money back in year one or year four. I think we all would agree that there's a really big difference to the investor when you get your money back in year one or year four, or most of your money back. So this is something that people like to throw this around. Um, I don't want to say bamboozle, but to oversimplify a project and say, you'll double your investment over four years, you'll double your $100,000 to $200,000, so you'll get a 25% um, simple rate of return. However, it, it totally disregards when you'll actually get that money. You might get all of the 100000 at the end of the um, four years. So then we get to, um, to the IRR. This, this is one of the truest yeah, ones. formula. In here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, anyone that can do this formula off the top of their head, um, come uh, see me. <laughs> I copy-pasted that formula. If you want to calculate your IRR, Google calculate IRR calculator something will pop up it basically will pop up and say how much money do you put in a year one how much money do you get back in year one how much in year two how much in year three how much in year four you can also go in Excel uh, or any other sheet provider that you like I use Google Sheets nowadays because it's free Cheap. free Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah free 99 Anyway, no, um, you can also calculate it in, um, in, in a spreadsheet, but like I said, there's online calculators too. <coughs> what does the internal rate of return do? This is basically the honest version of the simple rate of return. It tells you for the whole project, it says, you know, like, um, let's say you have the same project where you get a little bit of money in year one, two, and three, and then you get the rest of your return, your really big payday in year four. Internal rate of return, calculates that all back to present value. If you want to learn all about that, um, go to uh, Investorpedia. We have the link in one of the li later um, sheets and they will tell you all about it. It's quite a formula, uh, but what, what you should remember is this takes into account the time value of money. So in the example that I mentioned where you might get all your money back at the end of year one or most of your money back at the end of year one or most of your money back at the end of year four, um, if you only get your money back, most of it in year four, your IRR will drop. So basically, the simple rate of return for most real estate projects will always be higher than your internal rate of return. So that's why oftentimes in a prospectus, people will say, this is the simple rate of return. 
because it's easier for people to understand. Nobody understands this until they really researched it. However, this is a way, um, more honest way to compare two projects. Again, if you have a project, four-year project, where you get most of your money back in year two, and then it sells in year four, or you have the same project, but only now you get most of your money back in year four and just a little bit in all the other years, um, the project where you get your money back sooner is gonna have a way higher um, IRR. Does that make sense to everyone? Like the time value of money, it calculates it back to present value. Now I will also tell you, that, so that's the great thing about this. I will also give you the, um, um, the drawback uh, for uh, this one. Since it calculates all the returns of the project, because a multi-year project, it returns everything back to net present value. That means that it assumes that if you get your money back after six months or a year or part of your money back, it assumes that you can reinvest that money at the same IRR that this project has. So let's say the IRR is 18%. <clears throat> if you get your money back after a year, it assumes that you can say, oh yeah, thank you for giving me my first payment back of this $100,000. Now I'm just gonna put it over here and I'm also gonna get 18%. So what I'm saying is sometimes <clears throat> you might like a little bit of a lower IRR in return for a longer term project. If you have a very short term project, you might have a high RRR, but that means that after you did all the due diligence and all took the time to get to know the people to, that you did the project with, Six months later, you go, they go like, here's your money back. You've got a great IRR. Now you have to start the whole process over again. And that's where the, um, <coughs> the time value <coughs> of, of your money comes in as well. Do you uh, want your money back sooner or later? So a higher IRR on a shorter project might be what you want if you compare it to another shorter project. But if you have a longer project versus a shorter project, you might prefer the longer term project even though the IRR is slightly lower because yeah. you don't have to redeploy your money right away. Thank you. Thank you. I guess like an example for me and when I'm comparing, like I have a self-directed IRA and then I have my liquid capital. And so for my self-directed IRA, I actually prefer a longer investment and I'm willing to give up yeah. some uh, IRR points for that. <laughs> because it's sort of complicated. There's some paperwork to invest through your self-directed. Uh, and I also know that there's also restrictions on the type of properties and, or, you know, there's some restrictions with the self-directed. And there's some cost to get in the deal, right. like um, the acquisition cost, and there's the cost of the sale. So, and that's one yeah. of the things we're gonna get into later as well. All these things are percentages. Yep, so for that, I want a l little bit lower IRA I'm willing to accept, where if it's my liquid capital, I want the money back quickly because I'm always like finding deals or finding opportunities. And so I have no problem uh, turning that over quickly. Yep. So yeah, so the final one, the debt surface coverage ratio. This is it, your favorite, right? You're always saying this to me. <laughs> this, this is the last one, so I think by now it's everyone's favorite. <laughs> Who here is, uh, has, has never heard the word debt service coverage ratio before? Okay, a few, I'd say about- Under a rock over here? Yes. Just kidding. <laughs> so debt service coverage ratio, what, what, let's first talk about what does this ratio really mean? This ratio means how much money are you on like an annual basis are actually gonna put into your pocket. So a lot of, now you say like, but isn't that cash on cash? Cash on cash is not the um, same because cash on cash, some of that money that is your cash that you get back might go towards your loan. Because we remember all of these ratios that, or all of these, some of these ratios that we've talked about so far, they disregard your um, your payments on the loan, the repayments on the loan. I'm not talking about interest. Interest is an expense that a lot of these ratios take into account. I'm talking about repayment on the loan. I can make you a sketch of a, a project where you're making quite a bit of money in all these ratios and it looks pretty good. However, all that money goes back to repayment on the principal of your loan. So what does that soft surface coverage ratio um, express? It expresses, so you have the income of the project um, minus the expenses. So now you have the, the net income, the net operating income. 
after that, you still need to make uh, the repayment on your loan. So your expenses contain your interest, but now you need to make your repayment on your um, loan. After you repay your loan, how much money are you going to put actually into your pocket? Because your repayment on the loan, that money is profit for you, but only profit on paper. So you can do a project where you're actually making money um, on paper because you're repaying your loans, you're increasing your equity, but you put zero dollars in your pocket every month, and that is very risky. And in the environment that we're in right now, um, where deals are harder and harder to find, it's harder and harder to find a deal with a good debt service coverage ratio. So basically, you can still find deals pretty easily where on paper, yeah, you make money as long as you hold on to the deal. But most of that money in reality goes towards repayment of your loan. So that means if anything happens, anything unexpected, like we're talking about a roof go goes out or maybe even a bigger ex expense, how are you going to pay that? You cannot go towards the money you already repaid on your loan and say, I'll take that money back out now and put it on the roof. It doesn't work that, that way. So your debt service cover coverage ratio is your net operating income. That's your uh, income minus expenses divided by your principal and interest that you repay to the um, loan. So your NOI divided by your, uh, your debt service, basically. So the higher this number is, let's say this number is 1.5. That means that you're putting, even after you repay um, your loan and your interest, you're putting a lot of money in your pocket. And it's not just about, oh, I want to put more money in my pocket. That money is also your buffer if there's a problem. Because if there's a problem that you need to pay for, you cannot pay that out of money you repay to your uh, loan. So banks think, think this is really important because banks want you to make money. That sounds really funny, but if a bank um, loans you money to buy a property, for example, this property in uh, Yuba City, the 38 unit that we're uh, closing on on the 15th of next month, the bank wants to make sure that at the end of every year, I and my partners are making money because they are afraid that if we don't make money, we're not going to be interested in staying in the deal. And we're basically going to say, why don't you take this thing from us? Because we're not making any money, so we're not going to do any work for it. So the bank will demand a debt service coverage ratio of typically of 1.25. But if you're in a smaller market, like, for example, the Yuba City market, we had to get a debt service cover ratio of 1.35 because the banks consider that market as a little bit more risky than a huge market like Dallas, which they consider a little bit more um, static. It doesn't move around as much. So they wanted the debt service coverage ratio of 1.35. So what does that mean? That means that they look at the repayment on a loan and the amount of money that you make. And since they cannot change the amount of money that you'll make, they'll lower the amount of loan that they will give you so that your repayment on the loan, your uh, payment and interest, gets lower. So there's two ways in which the bank limits how much money they're going to give you on a project. One of them is loan to value. For example, they might say, we only want to give you a loan for 65% of the property and you have to come down, pay down 45% of the uh, money needed for the project. So that is the loan to value. The other one that's increasingly important in today's market is the debt service coverage ratio. So a bank on a project, if you buy a multifamily, like a very nice area of Dallas, they love Dallas right now, and all the numbers look good otherwise, they might give you a debt service coverage ratio of 1.2 even, which means that you make pretty little money every month that you put in your pocket, but they consider it so safe that they think that's good enough. If you buy in, let's say you'd want to buy the same apartment building in, I'm going to, again, I'm going to rag on Detroit because it's easy. Um, they might say we want a debt service coverage ratio of, of 1.5 because on paper you might make all that money, but in reality we want to put a little bit of a buffer in place there. So that that's why the debt service coverage ratio um, is so important and not just because the banks care, you should also care <coughs> because you can make all the other numbers work maybe, but if your debt service coverage ratio is not in place, you're not actually putting money in your pocket. You might be repaying your loan, but if anything happens, anything unexpected, all of a sudden you have no funds to cover that because you weren't making money to begin with. You were just, and why, wh why would you even try that? Why would you try to not make money to begin with? Some people say, hey, I'll get it when I sell the property in three to five years. 
So they'll be working for almost no money with a very low def debt service coverage ratio for three to five years, and then they'd be selling it, and then they'd be making their real money. Uh, however, if something happens in the interim, you have a big problem. So did, did this is one banks care about this, and you should really also care about this, because this means are you actually getting some money out of the deal while, you, while you're in the deal, not just when you sell it. So that was our last uh, ratio and uh, metrics. And now let's talk about some things that are not metrics. Why don't you start? All right, I'll, I'll start it. Um, so important things uh, these metrics don't cover because we gave a lot of caveats and uh, we mentioned some use cases. But with the exception of pro formas, uh, numbers don't lie. However, they can deceive. So all metrics we covered ignore some important considerations. And so we'll go through this list. Yeah. So risk profile of the investment is very much something that you can't see on paper, right? Mm -hmm. Seem to see the property. Oh, the roof's about to fall in. Uh, I might want to build that into my expenses. Or, uh, or, or you're, you're in a market that is right at the peak of sure. the market. So basically none of these ratios consider risk. So if one investment, let's say it's a development project where, the, where there's not even permits yet, and on paper it looks like all the numbers work, and the other one is an existing multifamily property that is in very good shape, doesn't need any repairs, the roof is not about to fall down, one of them is a lot less risky, the other one is considered higher risk. It's not necessarily bad to go with a project that has a little bit of a higher risk profile, as long as you know what you're getting into and you're getting a return for that. So if the risk is higher, you'd want a higher return and you'd want to be aware of that. So right. that, that, that's one of the things. None of these metrics covers that. Then you've got demographics, market, etc. So, And this ties into the risk a little bit. But also, you'll want to. It'll help you think through other things like: Is there appreciation on the table? Uh, how stable is my rental income? Are there jobs where you where you buy the property? Right. On, on paper, all the numbers look good, but one market every year there's less jobs than the previous year. Or by the way, they just closed the AC Delco plant, which employed eighty percent of the um, town. All all those sort of demographics are not taken into account and. You know how they say location, location, location in real estate? Um, none of these metrics say anything about location or demographics or anything like that. So those are obviously very um, important uh, considerations that are not reflected in these numbers. And then the next one <laughs> we kind of made up between ourselves. That doesn't mean it's not a real thing, though. Headache per dollar. And you can also consider like your time, right? So you only have so many hours to deal with each real estate project. Yep. And so if one's tying up half of your day and now you, you can't buy as many as you would have, you're, it's not only is it a stressor and you're, you're up late night thinking about this problem property, mm -hmm. uh, but you're also not able to do other properties because this one's a, a headache. Yeah, like for example, think think about our uh, our sponsor Topstone and the 1% um, you can get uh, through the private lending. That is not the highest return you can ever get. However, it's the lowest headache per dollar that you can ever get. And what, what also ties into the headache per dollar, and I put that way at the end where it says percentage versus dollar. <clears throat> if I would tell you guys, would you like an investment that gives you like 100% return on investment in one year, you guys would say, yeah, that sounds great, right? However, I didn't say that the investment was $10 and it was going to cost you an hour every week. That, of course, is a very extreme example, but that also is, an, um, is, is, is part of what I wanted to illustrate with, with the headache per dollar. All of these uh, ratios, like cash and cash return and such, they're all percentages. <clears throat> you want to deploy as much money um, at a time, in my mind at least. Let's say every investment costs you an hour per week of work. Would you rather deploy $1,000 per investment or $100,000 per investment if the time investment per week is the same. So the cash and cash return will be the same for both projects. The only thing that's totally ignored in all these ratios, and I think that's very important to mention, is, is your time and the amount of energy that you will spend on it. Let's say the, um, the uh, ratios look very good, 
but it will take you many, many hours to learn about the project and to learn about the partners and to, um, to manage the project and to babysit it. Um, is it still worth it? So as a percentage, it might look good, but also look at the actual dollar amount. Um, if you buy a duplex in Stockholm right now, um, you might make eh, maybe four, five grand a year. Would that be worth it for you? Three or no, probably on average three tenants a year because one of them's and then all the other headaches that come with that. Investments tend to be less passive than big in my personal experience. So yes. would you want to add to, to, to that rider? No, I, I think I think we captured it. Yeah. Um, then you've got tax implications. This is a big one. Yeah. Uh, there's certain things you can write off. There's certain property types that are more tax advantaged than others. Like for example, the uh, private lending I was just just mentioning. That's your lowest headache yep. per dollar. No tax advantages. And states and property tax in certain areas much higher than others. Yep. Uh, liquidity or lack thereof and associated opportunity cost. Yeah. So if you buy this property, what other properties are you now not able to buy? Not buying, yes. Don't look at just what can you buy, but let's say you tie your money up for 10 years. What can't you buy? Is there going to be a downturn <clears throat> in three, four years that would give you access to awesome deals? But only you can't because your money's tied up. So also look at that. Is it an investment that you have different exit strategies if you need your money anywhere else? Or is your money tied up for a longer period of time? Sometimes you'll want your money to be in there for a longer period of time. But you got to realize that beforehand. And these ratios will not help you with that. Then you've got scalability. So if I buy this one, how repeatable is that? How scalable is my model? Uh, then ulterior motives and the need to get started, connected, and track record. Yeah, so, so basically... Yeah, are you trying yeah. to build your experience so that when you go to the bank next time, it's easier to get a loan? Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So so there, there can be reasons beyond this particular deal why, why you still might want to do it. Some people yeah. have a very hard time getting started because they can't find a perfect deal in the end. They'll never get started. Then I say... If that's your real problem, get started on a deal that's not so perfect. Yeah, the ratios might not be all perfect, but if you can make it work and that's what you need to get started, get started. Because it's a lot better, I think on bigger pockets they have this thing where they say it's a lot better to get, you know, so many percent on a deal than a hundred percent on no deal, for example. So some sometimes the ratios don't matter as much because you might have another uh, reason. For example, track record. One of the things this property in Yuba City is going to give me is it's going to get my name on a Fannie Mae um, small balance loan, which means next time that I want a Fannie Mae small balance loan, I can go to a bank and they'll give me a loan elsewhere as well. And then finally, uh, does it fit your why? And part of this goes back to the headache factor and time factor. Uh, but does it allow you to do like what you really want to be doing? Do you want to be an active landlord? Uh, you know, later in life or right now? Do you have time to deal with it? Maybe you have a full-time job or a company and you don't want to be spending a lot of time in real estate. Or maybe real estate is something you really want to learn about. You want to learn to, to flip houses so you don't mind buying a distressed property. So that's something to think about also when you're looking at deals. And conclusion. So we'll wrap this up. Uh, quick recap, uh, what have you learned? So besides the fact that metrics and ratios are super awesome and super sexy. Fun. <laughs> use the correct metrics and know why, uh, what the numbers mean, right? So apply the correct formula uh, in the right situation. Uh, we've given like, I feel like we've spent so much time giving caveats to every calculation. Uh, but the, the main thing is do the calculation still don't just fall in love with the kitchen. Uh, and and, you, and, and the, the colors. The color scheme. The tile. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, do these calculations, but keep in mind that it's, it's not uh, cut and dry. You need to think about other qualitative factors as well. Uh, we also want to remind you of our 
uh, awesome uh, sponsors, the Interest Group and Topstone. If you're interested in either, you can catch us afterwards. A great place to, you know, you're, gonna, you're probably not going to remember these formulas. Uh, if you're not able to remember all of them, then go to Investopedia or other resources online. And then, of course, check out our website, feigsf.com. Yeah.